Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Video Essentials 51. This is on ecosystems and how ecosystems can be impacted by changes in their environment. This right here is a picture of some contrails that are created. Contrails are created when jets fly over an area. Pollutants coming from the combustion of the jet fuel will actually have water vapor adhere to it and so you get the creation of a man-made cloud. And you can see how many of these contrails are creating. This is a satellite image over Nova Scotia and these are all the contrails that are created in a typical day. And so we're actually making clouds. Now what do those clouds do? Clouds will actually hold heat in. And so in Montana when it's going to be a clear night I know that in the winter especially like now it's going to get really really cold at night because the clouds aren't going to hold in that heat and so how could we ever study how how much of an impact are we having on the weather well we'd have to have a time when there are no jets flying and when would that happen well it's only happened really once after 9-11 we shut down jet traffic in the United States for a three-day period and so scientists were able to observe that three-day period and compare it to the days preceding it days after that and we were able to find that we had roughly a one degree Celsius change on the weather just during that one day period and weather remember over a long term is called climate and so we can impact ecosystems uh, just by changing the climate so basically in this podcast I'm going to talk about how ecosystems can be impacted by changes in their environment some of those are human changes and of course I'm going to talk about glo global warming or climate change we could also have geologic changes example I'll give you is continental drift and then finally we could have meteorological changes meteorological just seems simply means weather changes and so example I'll talk about is El Nino or a warming of the oceans and how that's actually impacting ecosystems on our planet. So let's start with global warming. This is a famous map. It basically compares the average temperature from 1950 to 1981, so a 30-year period, to uh, the 10-year period that we're just finishing. And basically anything on the map that's red means that it got warmer. Anything that on the map that's blue, which I can find a little bit down here, means that it got cooler. And then the gray areas means that we didn't get much data from that. And so you can see that there's a huge warming uh, over the last decade compared to the from the 50s to 1980. And so basically there's no credible scientist out there that's saying that there's not global warming and there's no credible scientist out there who's saying that humans aren't having an impact on that. And so a couple of examples of feedback loops because that's again one of our major themes. This would be in the permafrost. So as permafrost starts to melt it gives off a methane gas. Methane gas is a really good greenhouse gas and so that's going to increase the temperature through the greenhouse effect which is going to warm the permafrost which is going to create more methane gas and so you know we call that a positive feedback loop now some of that heat's going to dissipate from the arctic and so this is not really a localized uh, phenomenon but it is going to increase global warming that's why we're going to see an increase over the next 100 years one that's more global would be the increase that we're seeing in water vapor and so this is from 1980 to 2004 this is just looking at the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere and you can see that we're seeing an increase in the amount of water vapor what is that h2o going to do in the atmosphere well it's going to increase the temperature it's going to increase the temperature which creates more water vapor which is going to increase the temperature and so basically our temperature is being increased by changes that we're having on our planet because it's not just weather it's, excuse me it's not just water and, and methane it's going to be carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases that are increasing the temperature and it'll take a while for that to actually take off and we're starting to experience that right now how much of an impact is it going to have on ecosystems well it's first of all going to affect ecosystems that are more susceptible to changes in temperature and so this is data that I got from the intergovernmental panel on climate change so it's a, basically almost 200 countries take all their data they compile it together and they're looking at how changes in the temperature are going to affect our planet. Now they're not necessarily looking at ecosystems but that's a part of the study that they did. And basically what they predicted is if we see a half a degree Celsius change over the next hundred years we're going to have damage to the coral reefs and the Arctic ecosystems. Now of course we're going to impact the Arctic ecosystems more than those closer we'll say to the equator because any warming is going to change that climate there and so it's going to impact species that have evolved to live in a cold area example could be like the polar bears now coral reefs are damaged in a different way let me click to the next slide if we see a one degree change all the coral reefs will become bleached so basically 
uh, a coral is made up of two things. You have a, a coral, which is essentially an animal, and then you have an algae that lives mutualistically with them. And so basically the coral will extrude that algae so they become bleached and they can't use the, the photosynthetic features of the algae anymore. And so it's a defense mechanism to changes in the temperature. What, that's why they'll be impacted. But if we see a one degree change, they're predicting that we'll see 10% of the global ecosystems will be transformed. And so basically what's going to happen is as we increase temperature, it's going to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And so it's going to impact these areas near the Arctic more than those areas near the equator as we warm up the temperature. Now it's happening so quickly that species who normally could evolve to changes like that aren't able to evolve quickly enough and so they're going to be impacted by that. So if we get a two degree change over the next hundred years we'll see mass mortality in the coral reefs, a sixth of all ecosystems will be transformed and this is where it gets a little bit of scary. A fourth of all species will be committed to extinction. It doesn't mean that they necessarily will go extinct but they will be headed down a pathway of extinction. And so what is extinction? It means when all the organisms of a specific species are gone from our planet. The opposite of that is an extant species is one that's around today. And so just a two degree change could have huge impacts on that. And they predicted a three degree change could get a third of all species on our planet going extinct. And so when you hear numbers about this being the greatest extinction that we've ever had, this man-made extinction, it's because we're getting changes in the temperature and those global changes in the temperature are gonna impact ecosystems and thereby in impact species in that area. They also predict that half of all nature preserves will be unable to meet their conservation objectives. So this is a uh, Pelican Island, one of the first national refuges that we have in, in, in the United States. And all of these are going to be impacted by changes in temperature. And the reason why is that species simply can't evolve quickly enough to changes that are glow three degree changes over a hundred, hundred year period. And so those are going to be man-made changes. But there have also been global changes not caused by man over time. One great example of that would be continental drift. All the continents on our planet, remember, used to be organized into one supercontinent called Pangaea. Pangaea broke apart into two subcontinents. We had, uh, this was Gondwana land or Gondwana, and then we had Laurasia in the north. And so basically when they figured this out, they looked at fossils and where fossils were found. And so we had fossils, not only do the continents fit together, but those continents had fossils that would move throughout all of them. So it was a good way to show, scientists show, that the continents had actually drifted apart. But basically that drifting has caused biogeographical changes or changes in the life that are living on those planets. And so we can look at where species are found and we can predict how those ecosystems had changed over time. Or we can at least um, go back and look through the evidence and figure out what happened over time. Example could be in the mammals uh, or the marsupial mammals. So basically there are three types of mammals. You've got the egg-laying mammals, example would be the platypus. You have the marsupial mammals, example would be like the kangaroo. And then you have the placental mammals, which is essentially everything that you think of as a mammal. And so if you think about where are the marsupials found on our planet, well, almost all the marsupials you can think of are found in uh, Australia. So koala bear is an example of that. But we also have marsupials in South America and we have one marsupial in North America. This is the possum. Uh, and so where, how did marsupials get where they were? Well basically what happened is we had marsupials in Gondwana. So we had them in Antarctica, we had them in Australia, and we had some of them in South America. Scientists don't think we had movement into Africa at all. So we had marsupials that are all across here and so basically, as those continents drifted, Antarctica got so cold, the ecosystem changed so much that all the marsupials died off there. We had the marsupials here in Australia that were adrift, so we didn't have the placental mammals there. And then we had those in South America. Now, South America eventually drifted into North America, and we had the movement of some of those marsupial mammals into North America, but mostly we had the movement of all the placental mammals down. So we had this battle of the mammals. Uh, and so basically, as continents drift about, they're going to change their climate and thereby they're going to change the ecosystems that they have. Now the last and the third type is how meteorological changes can actually impact ecosystems. And so this is El Nino. El Nino happens somewhere between every two to seven years. It kind of centers around five years. And basically what will happen is you'll have a warming of these waters in the uh, Pacific, so along the coast of 
uh, South America. So you get a warming in this area, and then it'll kind of go away. And then we have La Nina, and then we'll have El Nino. And so we have these changes uh, of the temperatures. And so basically, that's going to impact the ecosystems during those time periods. And so this is a marine iguana. It's a really cool kind of an animal. Basically, what it'll do is it'll sit on land. It'll get warmed up. They live in the Galapagos Islands, which are going to be right down here. Right, You could imagine in the middle of El Nino. And so basically what they do is they'll feed on algae underwater. So they swim down under the water. They feed on algae. They come back up to the surface. They're cold-blooded, so they have to warm up their bodies so they can digest that food. Then they go down again and get algae. Really cool-looking creature. Uh, look kind of prehistoric. But basically what happens to them during El Nino is that most of the land will actually do well because we're going to warm up the temperature. We get more precipitation. So a lot of the plants are going to do well. But the algae that live underwater are going to be impacted by that increase. So what does that do? Well, there's less algae. Now the marine iguanas, when they go down, aren't going to find as much algae, and so they're going to be impacted by that, or the ecosystem will be impacted by that. And so scientists found that you see a 20% decrease in the length of iguanas during an El Nino period. Now, why is that? Well, the two reasons. Number one is that they'll actually shrink their body in response to El Nino. So their bones will actually get shorter, which is crazy if you think about what if I were to get 20% shorter when it gets just a little bit warmer. And so there's a stress hormone that's released that's actually making their bones shorten, which is pretty cool. But there's also selection going on. In other words, if you're a big marine iguana, you're going to have to dive deeper to find algae. You're going to have to come back on land. It's going to take you longer for your body to warm up so that you can actually digest the food so you can go back down again. And so now we see selective pressure on the larger um, marine iguanas. And so we're going to see a movement towards smaller body size. And so again, just simple changes in the temperature can have huge impacts on an ecosystem. And even though we might think we're having small impacts on our climate, humans are having great impacts on our climate, which is going to kind of feed back out of control over the next hundred years. And we're going to see changes in the environment. Uh, but hopefully we can mediate some of that just through education. And so I hope that's helpful.